We're going to launch a new series of messages today that we are calling Out of Focus with a question mark. The title is posed as a question because the intent of the series is to lead us to examine whether we have our focus in the right place in a number of different areas in our lives. I've made no secret about the fact over the last number of weeks that I've shared with you that I wasn't in what I would call a real healthy emotional place heading into the summer. On the dashboard of my life, my emotional tank was flashing the empty signal. Like so many of you, the COVID pandemic and all its repercussions was affecting me. There were so many frustrations, decisions, opinions, changes, and losses. Little by little, I feel like it had worn me out, and I found that thoughts of discouragement became harder to beat back. Grace for people was harder to find. Anxiety became somewhat of a regular visitor. And so I limped into summer, got away for a month, and did a little self-evaluation. And I realized that there were some things that I needed to change in my life. And I also realized that I had gotten out of focus in some areas. And so over the last two months, I feel like part of what I've been doing in my own personal life is refocusing some things. I've been in refocus mode. And so this series that we're going to do for you over the coming weeks is coming out of this place. You see, when I look around and when I evaluate our society and even more specifically our church... I see some refocusing that is required. There are many like me who need to make some adjustments and some changes. Some priorities need to be realigned. What is most important needs to be reclarified. Losing focus or focusing on the wrong things is, is very natural for us. If our lives are like a camera, then our default setting is the autofocus mode. I'm not much of a photographer, but I know that most professionals do not use the autofocus mode. They use the manual mode when taking pictures. The reason is, is that the autofocus mode takes control, and it decides what the focal point is going to be. Typically, the things that have the sharpest contrast are going to be the things that draw the eye of the camera. And so it's only by adjusting manually that the photographer can ensure that his focus is on exactly what he wants it to be. And our lives are like that. Whatever is making the most noise, whatever draws the strongest emotion, the latest crisis becomes the thing that we become the most fixated on, usually to our own detriment. And so only the decision to change from the autofocus mode to the manual mode and deliberately turn our focus where we want it to be will allow our lives to become the picture that God desires. Over and over in Scripture, we see that God challenges us to go into the manual mode, to manually focus our lives. We're told in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, to set our minds on things above not on earthly things. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first my kingdom and his righteousness. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul said, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. These are just a sample of the many areas that we are challenged to be intentional about what we give our attention to. What we focus on is so important because our focus is actually what determines the trajectory of our lives. What we focus on determines the trajectory of our lives. It determines whether we hit the ditch or whether we stay on the pavement and reach our destination. I think we would all agree that there is a lot of noise around us these days. There are a lot of storms that people are going through. There is upheaval everywhere. These things have our attention. But church, if we aren't careful, these things will consume us and ultimately sink us. Most of us are familiar with the story of Peter walking on the water in Scripture. Initially, he heard the voice of God that was calling him to come 
And that voice gave him the courage to jump over the side of the boat and onto the water where he began walking towards Jesus. But then he lost his focus. He turned his eyes from Jesus and turned them to the storm and to the waves that were around him. And the noise of the wind began to replace the voice of Jesus in his ears. And he began to go under until he turned his attention to the Lord again with a shout, help me, I'm going to drown. I find myself yelling help a lot of these days. Without him, I'm going to drown. But I thank God that when we call on his name and when we say, Jesus, help me, he's there. He's a present help in times of trouble. Even when we're going under, when we call his name, he reaches. And he holds us and he lifts us and he gives us the grace to walk on those waves and to walk on the storms of life. And so over the coming weeks, we're, we're going to zoom in on some specific areas and that we feel God would challenge us to make a point of emphasis and deliberately choose to make a priority. But today, as I introduce the series, I want to talk more from a general perspective this morning about how we can keep our focus by intentionally focusing in three main areas. And so to do this, I'm going to take you back to a story in Scripture that probably most of us are familiar with. There have been many sermons preached out of it. I've preached on this passage many times before, but it's a gooder. Under the leadership of Moses, God had brought the Israelites out of Egypt in dramatic fashion. And had led them through the wilderness to the edge of the land of Canaan. It was the land that God had promised to them many years earlier. Before they had ever even been slaves in Egypt. It was a land that they had been dreaming about. God had said that it was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And it provided hope for them as they suffered under Pharaoh. Joseph, uh, the great Joseph, had seen it through the eyes of faith. And he prophesied before he was, uh, as he was dying, that one day God was going to take those Israelites, bring them out of Egypt, bring them into the promised land. And he said, even though I'm dying, when you guys go, you bring my bones with you. I don't want to miss out. The promised land was something that they had lived with hopeful expectation about for years. And finally, they were there, right on the edge of their inheritance, right on the edge of the land of promise, the dream about to become a reality. And in Numbers chapter 13, verse 2, God says to Moses at this point, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. And so 12 leaders from the various tribes were sent to explore the land. Some translations use the word spy out the land. Others say to, uh, to scout or to explore. And, and I think that's more the accurate picture. If this was a spy operation uh, and a military operation, I don't think sending 12 makes the most sense. Probably two like we, we see later under Joshua. Uh, Joshua. This was more like when you're thinking about buying a new house in a new city and you go ahead to get a feel of the location. And so for 40 days, these 12 guys explored the land and they all experienced the exact same things. They all saw the fertility of the land, the size of the produce. They all saw the size of the fortified cities, the thickness of the walls, and even the size of the people that lived in the land. They all experienced the same thing and saw the same things. Yet despite this fact, they didn't all come to the same conclusions when they brought back their report. You know the song, 10 saw giants big and tall, two saw that God was in it all. Ten guys reported back that the land was impossible to conquer, but Joshua and Caleb said, we shouldn't delay. We should go right now. We can surely conquer it. You see, church, what we believe is not a product of what we see. It's a product of where we place our focus. 
One of the interesting things that we need to understand here is that all 12 of these guys were leaders in Israel. You know, sometimes when we look at this story, we feel like Joshua and Caleb were sort of the spiritual giants, and for some reason, Moses sent them along with 10 knuckleheads. But these 10 guys were all respected leaders in Israel as well. They were men who knew the promise of God. They were leading the people towards it. But sadly, they only ever got to the edge and never beyond it. You see, you can come right to the edge of promise and never possess it if you lose your focus. Even great people of faith have weak moments. And somewhere in the 40 days of exploration, these 10 men lost their focus and ultimately they lost their inheritance. Joshua and Caleb were different. They were able to maintain their focus and possess their inheritance by keeping their focus in three different areas and we can learn from them. The first one that we need to, <clears throat> to focus on is that we need to focus what we think. It's really easy to judge these 10 explorers and shake our heads at them. How could they be in the land of promise, the land that they've been talking about for hundreds of years? How can they finally uh, be in the land after they've experienced the Red Sea, seen manna fall from heaven, and still not believe? Why were they so preoccupied with the giants after everything that they've experienced leading up to this point? How could they forget the promise and be so focused on the problem? But you know, somebody said that context is the key to compassion. We can be really hard on people and very judgmental until we learn their story. Isn't that true? And then we begin to see things differently. At the beginning of Numbers 13, the instructions that God gave Moses were simple. Take one leader from each tribe and send them out to explore the land that I'm giving to the Israelites. That's it. That was all the instructions that God gave to Moses. Interestingly, the book of Deuteronomy tells us that it was actually the people's idea to go and explore the land. And that Moses went along with it. It seems as though the people came to Moses and said, we should explore the land. Moses went to God and said, should we do it? God says, send out one leader from each of the tribes. All right, go ahead if you want to. Perhaps it was a test for them. But he didn't give them any more instructions. But in verse 18, when Moses gives the instructions to the scouts, things got a whole lot more complex. In verse 18, he says to them, see what the land is like, what the people who live there are, whether they're strong, whether they're weak, whether they're few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? Why does it matter? How's the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Didn't God say it would be a land flowing with milk and honey? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. It seems as though God's list and Moses' list were not the same. Moses has them considering things that God never asked or, can, or intended for them to consider. This reminds me of when God first spoke to Moses in the burning bush when he called him to be the leader, the deliverer of his people. Immediately Moses began to protest, began to say, who am I to lead the people? And I don't even know who to say you are. And what if they don't believe me? And I'm horrible with words and I get tongue-tied. Moses had been given a simple call. But immediately he began considering things God had not asked him to consider. And that were actually irrelevant to God. Moses' instructions to the scouts, it appears to me, almost sets the table for their reports. No wonder they came back talking about walls and giants. Moses had asked them to think about things that God had never asked them to think about. You see, when you lose your consciousness of God, you become self-conscious. 
When you lose your consciousness of God, you become self-conscious. When I start thinking about things that God never asked me to think about, I start undermining the very confidence that I need to move forward in the things that he's called me to do. And I think we're all guilty of doing exactly what Moses did at different times in our life. God gives us simple instructions, and we start adding all kinds of considerations. Let me give you an example. Perhaps you heard somebody preach about tithing. And I feel stirred in my heart that I should begin to trust God with the tithe. But then I start considering, am I going to get that promotion? What kind of bills do I have to pay this month? What about that vacation we've been planning for the summer? Or we feel God calling us to be a part of a ministry. And then we compare ourselves to someone else in the ministry who's got more gifting, comes from a different background, has more experience. But God never asked us to consider these things. And to me, this is where the ten men went wrong. They started considering things that God never asked them to consider and undermined the very confidence that they needed. God was sending them into the land. Why? Because he wanted them to come back with a report that would encourage the people and bring excitement and confirm that the land was exactly as God had said it was. But I think the instructions of Moses had them thinking about the wrong things. And as a result, they discouraged the people by having them focus on the wrong things as well. So what's the application? The application is we have to focus our thoughts. We have thoughts coming up all the time that dictate to us what we believe and the conclusions we come to. And we never stop to ask the question, where did these thoughts even come from? What if you took the time to think about what you're thinking about? 2 Corinthians 10.5 says we demolish arguments. And every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Paul is saying here that as believers we are to take every thought that passes through our brains and make it submit to what God has spoken over our lives. If God hasn't said it, I don't need to think about it. Church, if you're going to inherit all that God has for you, you need to focus what you think. What we believe is not a product of what we see. It's a product of our focus. Joshua and Caleb never allowed themselves to consider anything other than what God had said. And so their faith never wavered. The second thing we need to do is we need to focus what we hear. In Numbers 13, 27, we get the beginning of the report back. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. They should have stopped right there. That was all they needed to report. But. You know, there's some big buts in the Bible. And this is one of them. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. Those were the giants. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live the sea and along the Jordan. It's full of all the tights. The report back starts great. The land is exactly as God said it would be. It flows with milk and honey. Look at the size of the fruit. But it's at this point that everything shifted. In the very same sentence, notice this. In the very same sentence where they confirm that what God has said is true, they begin to shift their focus from God 
to the impossibility of the situation. And they caused such a stir in the people because in verse 30 it says, but Caleb tried to quiet the people. I mean, there was like a murmur. There was like an uproar. And Caleb tries to quiet the people and he says, let's go at once to take the land. Come on, we can certainly conquer them. We can do this. As the report of the fortified cities and giants is spoken and the list of all the nations is given and the people are panicking and murmuring and getting angry, Caleb steps in at that moment. He does everything he can to quiet the people. Basically, Caleb is saying, I don't need to hear all that. Shut up. We don't need to be talking about that. Why are you emphasizing that stuff? It wasn't that Caleb wasn't aware of the giants. He knew about them. He spent 40 days in the land like the rest of them, looking at the exact same stuff. But Caleb was saying, I don't need to hear that. You know, sometimes there are people in our lives who love to tell us all the things that we need to deal with, all the reasons why something isn't going to work, why something is impossible. And it ain't news to any of us. We know about it. We know they're there. And so this isn't something we need to hear. And if we keep listening to these voices, they're going to steal our courage and get our focus off of God. I don't want those kind of voices in my life. I want people around me who can speak God's promises over my life and remind me what God has declared over my life. If God said he was going to give us the land, that I don't need to hear you talking about all the giants. Be quiet. When the men switched from talking about how great the land was and said, but Caleb stepped in and said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. There are some of us that God has spoken to. And we have promises in our lives. But we haven't moved forward because there are voices in our lives that are talking us out of what God has called us into. Many times it's the voice of the enemy himself in a whisper in our spirit saying things like, do you think you are qualified for that? Do you want to go through all that again? Where are you going to get the resources? And when we listen to these voices... They talk us out of what God is calling us into. And so, church, we need to be selective in our hearing. In my house, I can be sitting in the living room. The kids can be in their bedroom. If I yell out, hey, kids, anybody want to go to Dairy Queen? They can have their headphones on. They can be uh, playing a video game, watching a movie, and they will come running from everywhere. But if I say, hey, kids, the dishwasher needs emptying. (laughs) What? Huh? I got selective hearing. In church, that's the way we need to be when the voices around us want to take our focus off of what God has said. I don't want to hear it. I'm not listening. Our faith, notice this, our faith is a product of our focus. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So my faith is not determined by what I see. My faith is determined by what I hear. Therefore, I'm going to submit my life under the words that God has spoken over my life. God says that I belong to him, that I'm his child, that no weapon formed against me will prosper, that I have a hope and a future. I don't want to hear anything else. I don't want people around me who are going to be talking me out of the battle. I need people who will come into the battle with me. Declaring that what God has spoken is going to come to pass in my life. Church, what voices are you allowing to speak into your life? Caleb silenced the people. He wasn't going to listen to the voices. His focus was on the voice of God's. Where's your focus today? Finally, we need to focus what we say. In this story, there was a clear difference 
in the way that Caleb and Joshua talked about their situation and the way the other ten guys did. Sometimes when we read this story, we think that the ten guys were lying. They were exaggerating in their report. Maybe they were just cowards. They just didn't want the fight, and so they made things sound worse than they really were. We could think they were making it up because Joshua and Caleb just seemed so stinking confident. Talked like it was nothing. But were they lying? I don't think they were. Verse 32 at the beginning says, So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. It was a bad report, but it wasn't a false report. What they saw in the land was very much real. There were giants and there were great walled cities. They were not deceived in what they saw. They were deceived in what they said. Verse 32 continues. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. They started saying crazy things like we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they were thinking. How did they know what they were thinking? They didn't. They had reached their own conclusions. In fact, we find out later when the Israelites did go into the land that they were terrified of the Israelites because they had heard about how, what God had did in, in Egypt and how he had brought them through the Red Sea. You see, oftentimes the enemy will have us looking at a very real situation and having us come up with false conclusions then what you say becomes a reflection of what you believe because there's very little space between what you say and what you believe. The more these guys started speaking about how weak they were, the more they believed it. The enemy deceived them in what they said. Church, many of us are looking at a very real situation, but God is wanting to challenge us today to change the way we're talking about it. We need to focus what we are saying in such a way that it is aligned with what God is saying. Are you saying what God is saying? You know, sometimes we have to look the situation right in the face and say, yeah, I know you're there, but what my God has spoken is true, and if he said he will give me the land, he will give me the land. In the next chapter of the whole community, because of the report, are weeping. They're panicking. They're plotting how to oust Moses and how they can go back to Egypt. But then we see Joshua and Caleb just repeating God's promise. It says in verse 6 of Numbers 14, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. He was speaking the word of God over the situation. They just kept repeating God's promises. Church, many of you are in a battle today. And we certainly are as a church. But there are always battles to fight and things that we have to go through to inherit God's promises. But if God says he will give them to us, then he will give them to us. Keep declaring his promises. Church, what you believe is not a product of what you see. For 40 days, all 12 guys saw the exact same things and yet reached entirely different conclusions. What you believe is a product of your focus. And so you have to focus what you think, 
Focus what you hear and focus what you say. Ten guys lost their focus and they never stepped foot in the promised land again. The other two kept their focus and they led a generation into their destiny. Where's your focus today? Is your life out of focus? I feel like God would challenge us this morning to manually begin to make some adjustments in our lives. Over the coming weeks, we want to key in on some areas and make some manual adjustments. It's a time where we need to get our focus in some different places, church. Would you agree with me? Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Let's turn our attention towards the Lord this morning. Father, we come to you. We confess. We've gotten our eyes on the wrong things. Lord, I believe even as I've preached this morning, you've just been putting your finger on some different things in our lives. The Holy Spirit's just been making its own application in different areas of our hearts. Father, in those places today, we just bring them before you, God, and we repent, and we make a deliberate decision. I'm going to begin to think differently about this, and begin to be careful about what I allow myself to hear. I'm I'm going to change the way I speak about these things. I'm turning my attention back on the Lord. I'm turning my attention back on his promises, back on his faithfulness. Father, forgive us where we've gotten our eyes on the storms and the waves. God, we just come before you today. Lord, we're just honestly saying in some areas we're drowning. We've been drowning. So, Lord, we just cry out to you for help. We're turning our eyes back to you. Jesus, help. Help us. Oh, God, would you lift us? Would you strengthen us? Would you give us your courage and your grace to walk on the storms of life? Oh, God, would you help us to get our perspective in the right place? In Jesus' name. God, would you help us as a church to get our focus back where it needs to be? Father, I pray in the coming weeks that you would refine our focus. God, I pray that you would speak to us and challenge us God, we don't want to miss our inheritance. We don't want to miss out on the destiny that you have for us. We don't want to come to the edge and not go in. God, we want to be all that you've called us to be and do all that you've called us to do. And so, Lord, we come to refocus our lives back on you and who you are. Thank you for your presence that's been here with us this morning. You're a good God. You're a faithful God. And we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Are you blessed, church? Amen.